Good evening. Uh, I don't know how long. Uh, you'll have to probably tell me a couple times, either slow down or talk louder. Um, so I'm going to talk about the evolution of the, of the environmental movement, but kind of broader, the, the whole civic ecology of Portland, especially since World War II, and just look at the changes and what, why they've happened over that time. Uh, this is just to verify the fact that I'm both a very much of a native. That's me as a Rose Festival princess. Uh, but I also travel broadly. I've, I think I've traveled 500,000 miles now in the last 10 years t telling the Portland story around the world. I'm going to only say two broad things about the 60s. <laughs> Funny thing about the 60s, I think, that we stole the zeitgeist. If you're a grandma, you can't, if someone says to you, like, I grew up in the 60s, what are you going to tell them? You almost have to tell them that story that was really created by probably only 15, 20 million people out of the whole population. And I also think we didn't really lose, we just set very unrealistic goals. Is that a different way of looking at it? We tried to levitate the Pentagon, and we didn't quite manage it. I was there, I'm actually in that photograph, which is a famous photograph. I was at, down at the other end of that line telling people back off because the bayonets, even though they're sheathed, they're still going to do us in. I also feel like this is probably where we might put another sign of good citizens are the riches of a city. Does anybody know why? The end of the Mount Hood Freeway, and I think, I haven't looked at it recently, but I think there's still an overpass to nowhere there. There's an exit that just ends, and I thought, isn't that a great monument to the end of the freeway movement in Portland? I do a lot of my research based on what I call a community narrative that's based on anthropological work by uh, Rappaport. And he talks about our society as that we all have stories. We have individual stories, community story, and then more uh, broader societal or cultural narratives. I think, whoops, did I skip something on there? Ah. And I think what I tell my students is, Portland, we began to develop and took control of our own narrative back in the 1970s during what I call the reconstruct, civic reconstruction period in Portland. And so we very purposely, I think, began to, maybe not conspiratorially, but we began to create our own ecotopian story here that by now has an outcome that more and more people accept. But it was kind of mythical. We used to get letters at Rain Magazine, which was an international journal of appropriate technology. People saying they want to move to the Northwest, they're going to come here, come here, it's beautiful. And we'd go back and no, the Willamette River's polluted and they're clear cutting. And I think we all collectively said, why are we doing that? Why don't we tell them that, oh yeah, come, man, it's so cool here, you can build Eden. In one sense, that's what happened. The story, the mythical story and that started in the 1970s has reached a tipping point around the year 2000 in which now that story is more true than not. And it begins to have an ethos of creativity. I couldn't find an arugula hot dog, that's why I had to do the two things, sorry. But I was, I was over a food cart and there's this, there was a person there with a hot dog with arugula and I thought, God, that is so Portland. You know, I mean, you couldn't do that in Chicago, right? You'd put sauerkraut, but arugula? So you begin to, there's an outcome to this kind of change of the narrative that's broad-based. This is another example. This is a, a, a PSU student who came up with this idea of how to deal with the fact that the homeless didn't have a, a bookmobile. If you were in Houston, do you think you would come up with a bicycle to put the bookmobile out there? No, but in Portland, you automatically kind of think that way. So I think the story has this economic and creativity outcome. So when did it really start? I think there was another invasion of Oregon back in the late 1960s, and what we call the young creatives today, there was another invasion of the young creatives in the 1960s. Oops, I have to read it off here, don't I? Sorry. So here's just something that a New York Times reporter said. New York Times reporter was baffled by the new, you know what, I have to get my glasses on, sorry. <laughs> this is a baby boomer presentation, you know, so. <laughs> uh, they had carved out homes made of cedar stumps, grew all their own food, made their clothes, and had tolerance for aberrant behavior. The reporter noted at one point a strange bearded man crawling through a pumpkin patch. His guide nonchalantly said, that's John, he likes to carve poems on the pumpkins. He's harmless. <laughs> okay, now pause for a minute. That was not the 1960s. 
That was the 1870s in Olympia, Washington, as, as codified by, in a book called The Utopian Societies of Puget Sound that parallels the other book by Jim Kopp, Lewis and Clark professor who died recently, who wrote another book on Oregon Commune. So there was a kind of a longer legacy of why did people move to the Northwest? There was those islands that was the last place you could move to. So people did move here with utopian ideals. When you look at these pictures, you can kind of see that that first picture is the Aurora Colony. If you can imagine the Aurora Colony, look at the numbers down below. I'm actually kind of a shock to Portlanders to realize a commune was moving into not too far from Portland that would be the equivalent of 200,000 people, given the population of Portland at that time. But look at that kind of similarity between the pranksters, trying life farm out Lake Oswego. There's kind of a legacy there. So this is what I mean, that there was a, this is why I can't do mics very well, but I keep moving around. Um, there was these migrations. We're familiar with the pioneers. We're familiar with the shipbuilders and what that did in the 1940s. Not as familiar with the fact that there was this young creative migration in the, in the late 1960s and 70s coming up a lot from California. And then there was actually Seattle when it fell apart. It, it, you could see our music scene increase during that time in the 90s when the grunge movement moved down here. So we tend to benefit from the fallout, right? They all moved up here after Haight-Ashbury fell apart with Charlie Manson, right? So they were like, let's go to Oregon. So we always like wait for everything to fall apart and then we gain from it, I think. <laughs> so these young creatives, and they settled especially in one summer, just to give you a size of the, this 10,000 hippies moved into one valley in southern Oregon near Tacoma. Uh, and uh, Tacoma, if you've not been there, is this land where there's UFO landing site, food co-op, and survivalists living next to door to, to hippies, right? But that, that migration, I think, had a huge impact. Most of the civic actions were not created by natives in Portland or in Oregon. They were created by outsiders during that period. This is 3.5 minutes of theory, just to, so you can follow the following ones, right? I don't know if it'll be 3.5, but anyway, if you remember it's social movement theory, that there's these four elements to it. The opportunity, the example of that is John F. Kennedy created opportunity for civil rights even though he didn't get to do anything, right? And then Linda Johnson followed with action. Social networks are very important um, during any time of evolution of social movement. Um, organizational structure goes in a period. Street action, you'll see in the slides coming up that the street action of the 60s in Portland and other places becomes the organizational structures of the 70s. Uh, and that's that, that time that those organizations, that's when people get co-opted or institutional, institutionalized, that's not right. <laughs> their, their motives, their, their, their work gets institutionalized into uh, government functions and policies, et cetera. And then that, that evolution of social movements is a series of innovations of, of, of how we interact with the pol uh, policymakers. So you look at the history of what happened in Portland and Oregon, you can see these kind of evolutions. You can look at uh, you know, the food movement that started in the, in the Northwest in 1974 with a conference of 800 people in Ellensburg, Washington. Bicycle lobby that was started at PSU eventually becomes the alternative transportation program. Uh, Nature in the City starts with Audubon and then moves out through Metro and BES. And these, this is one of the themes here I want you to get across is the important role of grassroots. We end up often thinking somehow that history is a series of leaders and they're very important, don't get me wrong, let's not kill them. <laughs> but, you know, the grassroots has to play this important function. There would not be a max if the citizens hadn't stopped the Mount Hood Freeway. And I love Adam Davis, he's a friend. But he said, like, for the driver's license registration, people should know all these leaders. And he listed people like McCall and everything. Went, well, what about? And you'll see here in a minute, for example, everybody goes, oh, didn't Governor Robert Straub and McCall, they saved our public beaches? How many people know about the group called SOS, Save Our Sands? That was the group that initiated it, right? And Pioneer Square, now the, now the Chamber of Commerce or whatever they call themselves these days, they take credit for the Pioneer Square and yet they resisted it, right? It was housewives from Northeast Portland, Betty Burton and others who really got the bricks started. So there's this constant theme of that we don't always understand how history is made. And, and we don't understand the evolution in this case. Like in the 1950s, most of the activity in Portland was women's clubs, 600 Women's Club, 10,000 members. That means one out of every 18 women was a part of, you know, the remaining one up by the Multnomah Athletic Club, the Portland Women's Forum. 
probably one of the, the best examples of a remaining women's club from that period. In the late 1970s and 80s, when the women's movement entered an organizational stage in Portland, there was 200 new organizations created in a very short amount of time. By the 1990s, only 30 of those existed. Does that mean they failed? Or does that mean their agenda got, got you know, did uh, w birth wife programs? No, they got incorporated into the hospitals, right? So it's not always a sense of just like, or if I look at a group like this, here's some really far out names of different groups from that period. They're no longer around. Does that mean they failed? Abundant Life Seed is one of the groups responsible for getting us seeds that are robust within our climate, right? Um, one of those groups up there, I think is up there, uh, was one of two groups that resettled Northeast Portland, the Learning Community at Reed College and Terra Square, or Quaker Commune, bought up something like 25 houses in a short amount of time. So they were the original urban pioneers of that area. We also don't know things like, I always like to put up a picture of my first wife because she died very young. But I was over at Metro one day and they say like, oh yeah, let me show your Japanese friends here our recycling program. And I went, ours? Wait a minute. And I realized that Metro didn't even understand that the recycling program they now govern it was started by the Oregon Environmental Council, DEQ then inherited, and then it went on to Metro, but they didn't even know that. Or if I show this kind of invisible role of citizens, this is a list of some of those things I just mentioned. People might know that first column, right? They'd say, oh yeah, wasn't the, uh, the neighborhood system was created by Goldschmidt, wasn't it? Well, actually it was created by um, Goldschmidt and uh, Pauline, uh, Lloyd Anderson, but but there was a whole uh, very active uh, citizen role in that, that 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 doesn't get played out. So then there's the other list. I go, all right, so why do we not know about those groups that played the critical role of starting it? You know, they got the, the ball rolling, right? When I look down the list of things we're proud of, not all these fit that category, but a lot of these, again, have a citizen base that we don't understand in our histories usually. So let's look at the civic reconstruction period, as I call it, the late 60s and early 70s. This is one of the most compelling charts done by my friend Robert Putnam in his book uh, called Better Together. Look at that chart for a minute. This is just one representative among many data sets that he put together about the declines of civic involvement in America. That's Portland's, and if you, oh, now's when I need the pointer. <laughs> I don't know where the pointer is. Can you see my pointer? Oh, there, see? <laughs> but look, that the line going up in terms of levels of citizen participation in the early 1970s, that's Portland. The other line going down is the rest of America. Something happened here in the early 1970s that meant that we were saying, let's get more people involved, not less. And what's interesting about that is a correlation between the innovations that we're so proud of, like land use system and thing. They all happened at that same time, the beginning of almost all of those things that we think of as our great institutions and policies come from that. I'm just gonna present a very short, long overview just to remind us that part of the Oregon story was always that they, they were moving here, fabled land of promise, right? But usually, this was part of the, the story too, that our basic narrative was not an indigenous native uh, narrative, it was a narrative of overcoming nature as a Time Magazine called it, Geographical Judo. They looked at the Corps of Engineer project saying that they reflected how we'd be able to expand almost indefinitely. They had, that they had, the Corps, had made rivers behave and had accomplished geographical judo. That was pretty typical of the outlook, I think, among some people when they first moved here. But there was always people crying out in the wind, William Finley, Stuart Hallbrook, and H.L. Davis, so there was some people. I'm gonna quote my favorite historian Carl Abbott in a, as a summary of uh, what was going on in the civic life as we came out of World War II. Remember, that was a great era of sacrifice. And so when people came back, they wanted to settle back into a life where there wasn't as much civic commitment because in one sense that was a huge civic commitment. My recollection of downtown Portland during that time, I, went, I spent a lot of downtown as a little kid because my mom was the head bookkeeper for the Portland Teachers Credit Union that a friend of ours started. And he would go out to dinner with it, and we'd go out to lunch at, Hen at Hilaire's and, and Huber's, and I got to go in there, even though I couldn't drink, obviously. They were all wore, they, what was interesting to me was they all wore bow ties, and they all had these coats that were kind of stained. And talk about buying local. I don't think any of those people in those downtown businesses in those days, they didn't even go travel outside the region. They went hunting and fishing. To them, vacation was the coast, right? 
So I just, it's interesting that it was almost like a bi-local movement before what we've said it is today. Civic life during that period up to the late 1960s, there wasn't much to do. Organizational structures and types of action lacked. Uh, there was no regulatory basis for it. Civic elite were mostly living above 200 feet. I've never tested that out, but I figure that's probably true, right? Knob Hill. <laughs> this was kind of what I read up. I wish I couldn't find the picture, the real picture I had to put up back when I knew. But there was this great moment of pictures of these women and very much mad women, kind of mad men, kind of outfits right from the 50s. Neatly dressed women of the Portland Garden Club formed the Beauty Brigade and marched on City Hall to oppose the auto ramps coming off two bridges in downtown Portland. By march, they mean they really walked in and then they showed a few minutes later having coffee or something with the city commissioner at the time. The environmental actions of the 1950s, there was only a handful of environmental groups. Most of the environmental groups of the 1950s before the Earth Day revolution uh, were industry-based, industrially based or funded. The only groups that were active during that time was Audubon, Isaac Walton, Federation of Outdoor Clubs, Mazamas, and Oregon Wildlife Federation. League of Women Voters did some campaigning for clean air. Smog was something that happened in LA, but we did start a, a air quality advisory committee in 58. Uh, but there was bad outcomes. And one of the things, as everybody knows, the history of I-5, Fremont, uh, Minnesota Freeway. But look at that first headline. That's what we thought of was going on, you know, when we cut through Northeast Portland, where everyone was kind of happy. You look at the news during that time and go, oh, yeah, they were okay with it, you know. We just took their institutions and their land and their neighborhood, but, you know, we gave them some money for it. It's one reason behind why we needed to be involved. The two areas that have the most rebellion, that the I-5 corridor and then also 205, like, likewise, there was no civic structure to resist those changes during that time. Willamette well, Heights, on the other hand, had, you know, they didn't, there was that inequality, right? Willamette well, Heights could resist their freeway development very easily. They had these meetings, there was only, what was it, there was only 50 homes affected, but their typical meetings were 200, and I'm sure high professional turnout. During the civic reconstruction period, then what we see is a complete turnover of civic organizations, different, a new citizen government relationship, and that the, uh, uh, the, the new kind of civic actions and practices during that same period then we see these things that I've already mentioned. Sustainability begins that far back, not as people think in the 1990s. Um, and during the same period, I'm running through a couple of these because I'm looking at my time, right? Are we still, do we start late? <laughs> it's okay, I only have about two more hours, don't worry about it. <laughs> Uh, so what you'll see during the, these first wave, like I say, there's this first wave of environmental organizations, late 60s, early 70s, Oregon Environmental Council, Thousand Friends of Oregon. So those were kind of the, what I would call the, and Osberg was an important one, the pre-Earth Day groups were around that period. This is one of the most telling things from some of the research I've done. If you look at that, these are, this is an inventory of all the civic organizations in Portland, right? So look at the first line. In 1960, I, I'm not going to go into the definition, but I hope you can kind of get what I mean by what is an advocacy group. Uh, there's 31 advocacy groups in 1960. By 1999, there's 400. <laughs> now look down at the bottom and look at how many of the traditional, that's like animal clubs, et cetera, right? Traditional civic groups, 370 in 1960, and by 1999, there's only 132 left in Portland anyway. That means 85% of the civic groups that dominated Portland's civic life in the 1950s no longer existed. And do homage to a friend of mine, Gretchen Forey, who just passed away, and there's a memorial service for her. You know, she did what we were all doing. She marched on City Club to say, hey, we want to join. What they did to a lot of us during that day is say, oh, get out of here. We're not interested in the environment, the issues that you're concerned with, and we don't like your way of acting. And I always thought, like, what did they think we were going to do? Walk away? Oh, yeah, you're right. Okay, never mind. I'm just going to go get a job. No, we didn't. So we went out and created new institutions by the hundreds. And so what is populated out there now is our generation's institutions for the most part. But we did also, be, we didn't, when I looked at some of the other day, this is a membership list or a database on the membership list of civic, organiz, uh, civic boards in Portland, you know, established commissions, citizen advisory groups. Look at the 1980s period, though. That's actually the height of populist pluralism, as I call it, in Portland. We've declined some since then. I don't think we believe as much as we did during that period in terms of the wisdom of crowds as we do did then. You can also see the change here. I did an inventory of the New York Times just to see how much the coverage of Oregon had changed or Portland. So in the 1960s, one item, 
about Portland and anything to do with green policies. And then look at the beginning of the 1970s. Again, a civic reconstruction period. Something happened in Oregon, we drank LSD or something, right? And the other part that changed was this, and as I said, there's this way Portland has adapted pretty well. They will sometimes respond initially not kind of negatively, but they will eventually incorporate. Like bike, the bike uh, activists at that time, um, you know, were on the streets protesting, trying to get bikes used more seriously as a consumer. And so what did the city say? He said, hey, why don't you come inside and we'll do a master plan together? So that can be either someone's helping you out with your policy, which I think was more true in Portland, or it's a way of co-opting people, right? Hey, we'll get them off the street, we'll tell them to do a master plan. So I think that what happened was we did gradually, and you can see it in a whole variety of fields where we tend to just bring the group in. City repair project, I was just with some Japanese visitors looking at things like that. First time I had Mark Lakeman out with city planners to see what he was doing, they said, Who's he? We do traffic calming. We don't need this young whippersnapper. But then they start changing it. Now they support convergence projects all over the city, right? Imagine what it felt like during that time. This is a, a take on what it felt like for the establishment of Ivancy, et cetera, during that time. Um, Mitzi Scott reports on what it felt like when they went to Neil Goldschmidt's election at this time. Remember, just before that, Frank Ivancy won over Tom Walsh when Tom Walsh was characterized as the king of the hippies, right? And he lost that election, but by 72, now we have a new hippie. These don't even look like hippies to me, by the way, but that's what they thought of them as, right? So one of the developers, George Reese, comes in and says, oh my God, if my people at the Arlington Club could see this now, they'd realize hippies had taken over Portland. <laughs> and I think just a couple of things just to see what happened during that time, the things we established during that time. What, what is, how did we do that? We have a land use system where the first rule is citizen involvement. It's not the resource specific. It's saying the first thing you need to do <laughs> is involve people. That is so radical a revolutionary of a step. And it helped create the Portland neighborhood system because now we need a structure for citizens to be involved in land use planning. And you look at the neighborhood system itself. It was not created by Lloyd and, and, and Neil Goldschmidt. It was created because of actions different in each part of town uh, that I don't have time to go into, but each part of area had a different action. Uh, where they were inspired to create the neighborhood system was Corbett Twilliger when they went there and realized that the activists uh, that included, uh, who's my private Idaho movie, uh, movie. <laughs> Gus. <laughs> that it was all these activists, John Platt and others, Penny Allen, that were in, Nor in Corbett Twilliger who lobbied for review of urban, you know, the establishment. They looked at Corbett Twilliger and said it should all be torn down. These are these old Victorian homes. So the establishment would say tear it down, the actors were saying save it at that time, and then they changed, right? Um, okay, one last thing I think, and then I'll, I have a lot of other things, but I just want to go over, because it's part, just another way of looking at the origins of the environmental movement is to look at sustainability, because that's a little bit different evolution. When we think of environment, maybe we think about saving the wilderness. Here's my way of looking at it. It's a very personal one, but it, it made sense to me. My wife at the time was one of the first Oregon Environmental Council employees along with Larry Williams. And she did the newsletter, among other things. So I was coming into her. I was running with rain, and we were beginning to look at all these multitude of issues. And I would come into the, say, hey, could you run an article on urban green spaces? Long, this is what Mike Houck and I were talking about way back then, but we hadn't done anything about it yet. And she'd say, no, no, there's no environment in the city. Uh, we're just trying to save, uh, you know, the wilderness out there. And then I said, well, what about uh, climate change and limits of growth? And she, they didn't really, you know, again, they were just trying to, they were very targeted towards saving wilderness. I started talking about green architecture. Uh, and again, th they didn't, no, we don't run articles on architecture. It's not related to the environment. Recycling, same thing. Community self-reliance, same thing. Energy, farming, all those issues I'd come to and say, like, and then I, I looked at this one day and I thought, well, that, is, is how the sustainability movement grew out of these more targeted environmental. It's, it's a rubric that includes all these perspectives. At that time, this is the kind of charts we put, we put together. These, in the early 1970s, this is our vision for Portland, right? Uh, it was done as an ecotopian vision done, done by Joel and Diane Schatz. Joel is now a billionaire in San Francisco. He was Governor Tom McCall's energy czar. And he'd go to these meetings, putting up these kind of flow charts. <laughs> and and, inter and they was also, he put out publications called like cosmic economics, right? 
Uh, you can just imagine that there was an energy office that came out of this, and if you look at some of the correspondence, it was clear that nobody wanted Joel to continue with his more radical McGovern-like perspective. Let's go back to something more sane like McCarthy, or, you know. So they wanted it a little, a uh, little more uh, standard. Uh, these are some of their early, uh, you know, documents that I'm just going to run through quickly. Um, our incentive was not climate change, you remember, during that time. It was the, we thought that we didn't real. we knew about fracking, but we thought, God, really? They were, it's too expensive or stupid. They're not going to do that, are they? But they did. We forgot how greedy people are. Uh, but, you know, we did this. I put together a map of the bioregion at that time, and never, nobody knew what a bioregion was. And my friend Bob Benson, self taught nudist socialist, uh, he somehow drew this map of our bioregion without even understanding things that Ecotrust did later. But look at this stuff we were putting together. This was a poster we put up, I mean, a, a workshop we put together on ecotopia, bioregionalism, and local self-reliance. It was uh, Ernest Kallenbach's first tour. Here's a greenhouse that we did. So first, this is a, over in northeast Portland, a demonstration green building, 1978. We put together this guide on knowing home, guide to sustainable Portland, 1982. So these are all predecessors who built some of the groundwork. And, and how it happens, it's like this. I used to go by the Everett Clearing Commons where Mike Lindberg always went there to have hot tubs, right? And I'd always see the book that we'd done, Knowing Home, in the back of his, he was on the rain board at that time. And if you look at the legacy, again, this is just part of that invisible history as I view it, right? We think somehow sustainability in Portland started in the 1990s when he went off to a UN conference in Brazil, right? And actually it started long before that. We lobbied for an energy commission back in the 70s and that energy commission was the predecessor to the sustainability commission. So again, it was a grassroots effort, not just a government led one. Same with the natural food movement. It was actually Wendell Berry's inspiration at Spokane that launched the alternative and natural foods movement uh, in, in uh, Northwest too. And we developed a thing called sustainable agriculture at that period. The last slide is just what we're up to now. Remember what I said. So at this time, there are something like 350 environmental and sustainability groups in the greater Portland area. That's a lot, right? And there was like, what, how many, as I said, like in the 1970s you know, or 60s, there was four. So now we have 350. Part of that explosion is the size and the way of, of looking at problems. We have watershed councils that didn't exist, friends of group. So there's a huge number of civic environment groups that are small and looking at one little area. Another example of that role is the you know, green space in Portland I mentioned before that Mike Houck and others have worked so diligently on. When we first started proposing, even to the planning community, that we wanted to move green spaces back into the urbanized areas, they said no, right? The idea behind our planning and urban growth boundaries is to densify and not have green spaces. And we had to prove to them that there was something worth Everybody had just dismissed Portland in 1985 as far as urban wildlife. Parks, yes, but urban wildlife? So we really had to propose to them that there was, so we did our own mapping. We, how paid for a flyover? Metro didn't pay the flyover. He actually funded the first flyover to develop a green spaces map. Oaks Bottom, he went down there and put up wildlife signs, very vigilante act. It was going to be a racetrack, right? But the civic leaders thought we should have a racetrack there. So he went out and bought his own wildlife signs and posted them all over and had a press conference and had all these people out to say, like, with Bogle, the commissioner, standing there going, well, of course we wouldn't put a racetrack here. It's a wildlife refuge. <laughs> nice self-fulfilling prophecy. So uh, last one again. Look at this chart again with just the green spaces. See where that arrow is? That's when citizens got involved. The increase in terms of the green spaces through bond measure and other things, it just goes off the charts once there's a grassroots effort to get it done. So I'll leave you with that for the moment. Thank you for um, inviting me to present. And before I start, I just wanted to give some props to the Oregon History Project and the Oregon Encyclopedia, um, which are just amazing resources and helped me a lot in trying to put together uh, the story that I want to tell this evening. In her popular Oregon Humanities talks, Professor Walida Imarisha has illuminated Oregon's deeply racialized history. From violent displacement of indigenous communities to persistent discrimination against people of color, whether African American, Asian, or Asian American, Native American, or Latino, Oregon, she argues convincingly, was built as a white utopia, 
and that past continues to shape our state in profound ways. My task this evening, as I see it, is to sketch out what the civil rights movement meant in Oregon. But where does one begin? The phrase civil rights movement brings to mind the successful struggle of African Americans to overturn segregation and disenfranchisement in the American South. A generation of historians has exploded that neatly packaged progressive story, illuminating evolving nationwide patterns of racial inequality and broadening our vision to capture a wide range of movements to win social and economic justice by women, LGBTQ people, various racial and ethnic groups, undocumented immigrants, poor and low-income Americans, workers, the disabled. All of these movements have Oregon stories, so you can imagine my dilemma. In the interest of telling a story that has texture, I'm going to focus this evening primarily on two Oregon movements, that of African Americans and lesbians and gay men, while pointing briefly to some other aspects of struggle and offering some broader national context. So the first moment I'd like to start with is the signing of Oregon's Civil Rights Bill in 1953. And this moment is the moment of post-war racial liberalism. So in 1953, Oregon became the 21st state to outlaw racial discrimination in public accommodations. Two years earlier, Oregon repealed a law prohibiting interracial marriage. And in 1957 and again in 1959, the legislature passed fair housing bills. This state level action occurred in the context of local activism as well as American global politics. As the United States asserted its leadership um, in promoting freedom and democracy worldwide, first in World War II and then in the Cold War, the nation embraced racial liberalism, a belief in legal equality and equal opportunity. In Oregon, chapters of the NAACP and the Urban League, local organizations, and allies in liberal and labor groups forged a civil rights coalition that, like coalitions elsewhere, demanded that the United States apply its rhetoric of democracy at home as well as abroad. In Oregon, the Civil Freedom Committee, organized to oppose civil rights legislation, Reverend Albert D. Riddick's charges that the public accommodations bill violated Oregonians' freedom of choice and mandated what he called compulsory equality enforced by the police power of the state are a reminder that not everyone viewed civil rights in the same way. African Americans' right to equal access violated white Americans' right to discriminate or their freedom of association. Such arguments, of course, failed to stymie civil rights legislation in Oregon. Nationally, too, the moral power of nonviolent direct action and televised demonstrations of white brutality in the South resulted in hard-fought victories for the movement. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965 altered the American racial calculus in key ways. Yet it took persistent activism for these laws to become meaningful. And even then, legal protection against discrimination could not overcome the legacy of institutionalized racism in Oregon or the rest of the country. Post-war racial liberalism also produced some paradoxical civil rights legacies, perhaps most importantly for Native Americans. Native American service in World War II and Cold War concerns about national identity and assimilation led Congress in 1953 to direct the federal government, and I'm quoting here, to make the Indians within the territorial limits of the United States subject to the same laws and entitled to the same privileges and responsibilities as are applicable to other citizens of the United States and to grant them all the rights and prerogatives pertaining to American citizenship. This sounds like ideal rhetoric for civil rights, but in fact, this was a bill mandating termination. In this bill, the legislation mandated that the federal government terminate its special relationship to Native Americans. As a result, members of Oregon's 60 tribes, along with many other Native Americans throughout the nation, lost their sovereignty, lost their access to federal services, and lost protection of their land. The results were devastating 
In 1976, a federal commission reported that as a result of termination, for example, Oregon's Klamath Indians, quote, lost their land and have nothing to show for that loss. As we'll see, for African Americans and Native Americans, and along with other groups, civil rights was no simple matter. And I want to move now to another moment. Um, this is a page from the Oregonian um, discussing um, Albina's riot in 1967. Um, and here we're going to switch from uh, a focus on racial liberalism to a focus on self-determination and community empowerment. In August 1967, a political rally in Portland's Irving Park exploded. Participants threw bottles and rocks at passing cars and into store windows, and Portland joined the nation's other cities that suffered long, hot summers of civil unrest. In an investigation of the riot, or the urban uprisings, or the rebellion, depending on one's interpretation, the City Club of Portland echoed the National Kerner Commission's findings. Systemic and institutionalized white racism in housing, education, employment, health services, and policing were to blame for the pent-up frustrations that sparked unrest. The difference between Portland's problems and those of Watts, Newark, or Detroit, the City Club claimed, were a matter of degree rather than kind. In fact, Portland's post-war urban development followed a familiar national pattern of suburban growth, urban disinvestment, and residential segregation, a process chronicled in works by Stuart McEldery and Karen Gibson. Before World War II, Oregon's African American population was very small, a legacy of racial exclusion. But the defense industry increased that population 10 times, to 25,000 by 1944. Portland responded with efforts to contain racial change. For example, um, efforts to maintain segregation in public accommodations, um, and uh, all kinds of discussions about the problems that these new urban migrants were causing. Black workers found jobs during the war, but exclusion from unions left them in the lowest paid positions. Portland's Housing Authority refused to construct adequate housing for defense workers, in part because they didn't want them to stay after the war leaving Kaiser Shipyards to build its own city, Vanport. After the war, inability to find employment or housing drove more than half of the wartime black population from the city. When a 1948 flood displaced uh, 16,000 remaining Vanport residents, one third of them black, those who remained in the city clustered in what was called the Albina District in the northeast quadrant of the city. Outright discrimination by private landlords, homeowners, and realtors, and by lending agencies and the Federal Housing Authority through the process of redlining, contained the city's black population and excluded them from areas of job growth, from finding affordable and well-maintained housing, and from accumulating wealth through property ownership, all of which had long-term consequences. Construction of Memorial Coliseum in the 1950s, I-5 in the 1960s, and the planned Emanuel Hospital expansion in the 1970s destroyed thousands of housing units and businesses. And here's a 1973 uh, protest against that Emanuel Hospital expansion. The state's fair housing legislation did little to ameliorate residential segregation and ghettoization with familiar results. Even as the Southern Civil Rights Movement won international attention, African Americans in cities like Portland tackled the complicated tangle of problems misleadingly referred to as de facto segregation. By the late 1960s, the failure of racial liberalism to address these deep-rooted problems led many African Americans to turn instead to community empowerment. In Portland, as elsewhere, schools and police relations were particularly contentious, and new organizations, the Black United Front, and a chapter of the Black Panther Party reflected shifting racial politics. In 1968, a handful of Portland's young African Americans began weekly political education classes. One of them, Kent Ford, this is Kent Ford here. Kent Ford was arrested in 1969 for fomenting a riot. He was acquitted and later won civil, uh, civil rights suit against the city. Um, but Ford soon announced the founding of a Portland chapter of the Black Panther Party, a group whose Oakland, California founders promoted both black power and revolutionary socialism, but which in most places focused most intently on the day-to-day -day problems of urban African-American communities. 
Percy Hampton, who joined the party while a student at Jefferson High School, recalled that the Portland chapter differed from the sensationalized images of Oakland's Panthers, whose guns served as crucial symbols of resistance. We never did openly display our weapons, he remembered. We tried to keep our issues focused and the violence and the rhetoric down. We didn't want anyone to perceive us as being out of control, gun-toting radicals. The group of about 50 members, a third of them women, focused on survival programs like the children, free children's breakfast program, a health clinic, and a dental clinic, which drew on extensive volunteer networks and provided crucial programs to the underserved community through 1979. Nonetheless, as Jules Boykoff and Martha Guise found, Oregon media typically used frames of violence and criminality when discussing the Panthers. The FBI and the Portland Police Investigative Unit also viewed the Panthers and other black activists as dangerous, particularly when they began challenging racist policing practices. Panther members faced harassment from police, though this was hardly unusual for the city's African American residents. One participant in the 1967 riot told a reporter, where else but in Albina do cops hang around the streets and parks all day like plantation overseers? Um, Albina, uh, sorry, just their presence antagonizes us. We feel like we are being watched all the time. As in other cities, conflicts with police radicalized young African Americans and prompted organizing and protest. In a 1969 class action lawsuit on behalf of more than 20,000 African American city residents, the plaintiffs insisted that police harassment forced black Portlanders to live, quote, in an atmosphere of fear and persecution and had a chilling effect upon the exercise of their federally protected rights. In the 1970s, African Americans made up 4% of Multnomah County residents, 22% of those arrested, and 60% of those killed by police. Despite community complaints and protests, and even a federal Department of Justice investigation, the Portland Police Association, the police union, met each reform proposal with what Leanne Cerbulo and Karen Gibson call swift and hostile resistance. In 1982, voters approved ballot measure 51, establishing the first civilian review board, but problems continued. In a 1985 case with particular contemporary relevance, Lloyd Tony Stevenson, an off-duty security guard, helped to calm a crowd in front of a convenience store in Northeast Portland. When the police arrived, they saw Stevenson, the only African American there, wrestled him to the ground, and an officer used a sleeper hold that killed him. On the day of Stevenson's funeral, two officers sold t-shirts reading, don't choke him, smoke him. Um, and while an inquest jury found Stevenson's death, which they said was a result not only of the sleeper hold, but the failure of officers to apply CPR, to be a homicide, a grand jury decided not to bring charges. The schools were another key battleground. Portland schools had not been officially segregated since 1872, but residential segregation and zoning policies produced the same results. In 1962, eight years after the Supreme Court declared uh, segregated schools to be unconstitutional, the NAACP accused Portland public schools of passively allowing segregation and inequality to persist. The district's own investigation acknowledged widespread discrimination, but its solution was hardly a solution. Its voluntary administrative transfer program mirrored the freedom of choice plans that districts across the country adopted to avoid integration. Protest and racial unrest grew. As local protest and federal pressure to address de facto segregation heated up, Portland Public Schools rejected a proposal offered by the Community Coalition for School Integration, which was a broad-based coalition of 28 organizations, for a two-way busing program. Instead, Portland Public Schools proposed closing several Albina neighborhood schools and a busing plan whose burden fell almost entirely on African-American students. Black parents and their allies protested throughout the late 1970s, and in 1979, the community-based Black United Front responded to the continued failure of PPS to achieve integrated and equitable education by demanding community empowerment. One of the group's leaders, Ron Herndon, 
was a Reed College graduate who had been active in the successful 1968 campaign to establish a black studies program at Reed, part of a nationwide movement to transform black political consciousness and racial politics through cultural empowerment. BUF demanded an end to all busing, the maintenance of Albina's neighborhood schools as important community resources, and multicultural curriculum for all Oregon students. The group's tactics included rallies, protests, and school boycotts, such as the one-day walkout of 4,000 African-American students in 1982 to protest the proposed closure of Harriet Tubman Middle School. And this is Ron Herndon up um, in the corner in the sweater on top of the table. The struggle to ensure educational equity in Portland and throughout the state is an ongoing one. Demands for community empowerment also shaped Native American politics in the 1960s and 70s. At Alcatraz Island in 1969 and the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota in 1973, Native American activists demanded federal restoration of Native land and sovereignty, and Congress reversed termination with the 1975 Indian Self-Determination Act. The Siletts led Oregon's tribes charged for restoration, and a number of tribes won restoration of some reservation lands, fishing rights, and sovereignty in the late 1970s and 1980s, beginning a process of economic and cultural revitalization. So moving to uh, another movement here, this is 1982 Gay Pride in Portland. The 1970s was also a watershed for movements for rights and recognition among women and gay men and lesbians. And these movements, too, suggest that the complexity of civil rights in the state's history mirrors a national story. Peter Boag has chronicled the long history of gay persecution in Oregon, a story that fits well within a national history of heteronormativity. As a national movement gained momentum in the early 1970s, activists in Portland, Eugene, Corvallis, and Klamath Falls began organizing to win basic civil rights and to build a society that would be safe and even celebratory of non-heteronormative sexualities. The movement included publications like The Fountain, organizations like the Portland Town Council, events such as gay pride celebrations, the first of which was held in Portland in 1971, and safe spaces such as the Second Foundation's Gay Community Center, which opened in Portland in 1972. But as in the rest of the nation, the course of civil rights for gays and lesbians was not a smooth one. Early victories included the 1971 repeal of the state's sodomy law and a 1974 Portland ordinance banning anti-gay discrimination in municipal employment. But the state's 1973 legislature which gave the state what Gretchen Kafori called the most progressive women's legislative accomplishments in the country, with bills mandating non-discrimination in various realms, access to family planning, and the state's first monetary contribution to child care, failed to pass gay rights legislation. This is um, uh, the bill um, from Vera Katz's um, files. There were other setbacks. Voters repealed a 1977 Eugene Ordinance protecting gays from discrimination in housing and employment, and a 1987 executive order prohibiting discrimination against gays in state employment. Oregon, like the nation, was clearly divided over gay rights, and the 1990s witnessed what Jacqueline Dirks has called a sex panic. In 1992, the Oregon Citizens Alliance, an anti-gay political action group, pushed ballot measure nine. And the title of that ballot measure, government cannot facilitate, must discourage homosexuality, other behaviors. Measure nine called for amending the Oregon Constitution to ban gay rights measures and to mandate that the state schools, quote, assist in setting a standard for Oregon's youth that recognizes homosexuality, pedophilia, sadism, and masochism as abnormal, wrong, unnatural, and perverse. Broad and bipartisan opposition defeated Measure 9, but OCA won anti-gay rights laws in at least 27 cities and counties. In 1996, activists established Basic Rights Oregon in response to anti-gay political campaigns and violence against the state's LGBT residents. 21st century legislative victories include the Oregon Equality Act, which protects LGBTQ people from discrimination in housing, employment, and public accommodations, the Oregon Family Fairness Law, which provides domestic partner rights to gay and lesbian couples, and the Oregon Safe Schools Act. 
The 21st century campaign for marriage rights has been equally divisive. Multnomah County briefly issued marriage licenses to same-sex couples in 2004. That November, Oregon voters passed Ballot Measure 36, which amended the state's constitution to define marriage as a union between one man and one woman. Last year, a federal district court ruled Oregon's 2004 constitutional amendment unconstitutional, and here's a celebration of that. National momentum is behind marriage equality. It's an important reminder that the advance of civil rights in Oregon, as in the nation as a whole, has been an uneven one. It is important to celebrate the individuals and organizations that have fought tirelessly to win greater equality. It's equally important to acknowledge the setbacks and limitations that continue to shape the state and the nation. So just by way of concluding, I want to point to some of, some of these issues. Um, here's a slide of the organization Don't Shoot PDX um, uh, protesting at a school board meeting, um, demanding more time to look over changes in, um, in attendance policies changes in attendance policies. Consider the evolving shape of racial inequality despite the achievements of the civil rights movement. Michelle Alexander's convincing case that a racialized system of mass incarceration adds up to the new Jim Crow has resonance in Oregon. With ballot measure 11 in 1994, Oregon joined the national trend of mandatory minimum sentencing. And today, our prisons contain one of the highest per capita percentages of African-American inmates in the nation. A 2012 Justice Department investigation found that the Portland Police Bureau had engaged in a pattern of excessive force, particularly against mentally ill suspects. A 2011 audit by the Fair Housing Council of Portland found that the city's landlords and leasing agents discriminated against black and Latino renters in 64% of the 50 tests across the city. And gentrification in North Portland has not only displaced many of the area's minority residents, but has also failed to solve the problem of unequal and segregated schools, as white parents employed the city's school choice policies to transfer out of the Jefferson Cluster. In Portland, as well as nationally, black and Latino students tend to attend schools with a substantial majority of poor children, while white and Asian students typically attend middle class schools. In fact, economic inequality, which has always intersected with racial and gender inequality, has grown substantially in the United States since the 1970s. Consider some of today's activist efforts. The movement for farm worker rights in Oregon, centered in Picoon, has a long and continuing history and demonstrates the wide range of issues that defy any narrow definition of civil rights, from immigrant rights and racial equality to health care, housing, and labor rights. Oregon's high rate of food insecurity and the work of organizations like Oregon Fair Share and its successor Oregon Action for public policies aimed at reducing hunger reflects a long history of anti-poverty activism in the state. Organizations like Portland's Right to Survive, founded in 2009, are fighting for the rights of poor and homeless Oregonians in the midst of a nationwide trend toward criminalizing poverty and homelessness, including proposed right to rest legislation. Today, as in the past, economic justice is central to the campaigns we think of as part of the civil rights movement. The history is complex, the story is important, and the way forward difficult but promising. Thanks. <laughs>